we have two excellent, excellent oh, so presenters. Oh. Um, not only are they colleagues of ours uh, that are in the Catholic uh, Church, but they are also uh, professionals in that they are part of Ring Pittsburgh, which is a professional organization of ringers in the Pittsburgh area. And um, we've always depended on uh, Mary Reed in the past to be our our authority, but I didn't realize it was all rubbing off from her husband, Jim. <laughs> Jim is also the director of a uh, handbell ensemble in the uh, Neighbors North Catholic community. And um, is that? That's right. St. Teresa, St. Sebastian, Anthanasius, and Incarnation. Yeah, from, yeah, we're we're getting used to a litany whenever yeah. it comes to naming a parish <laughs> anymore. Uh, at some point, you know, we'll be parish A, B, C, D. But there's only going to be 26. <clears throat> Is this being filmed, David? Oh, uh, <laughs> just, 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 because we want to get two hours of good work done. Yes, we do. Mary Rita and Jim Thank Rosetti. You. Thank you, Kevin. You're so sweet. Oh, 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 that's the handbell thing. Yes. You know what? Why don't you sit down? Okay. I will feel a little less short. We have another chair. Yeah. So no. We need okay. another chair. We still need another chair. Okay. Okay. Heck no. <laughs> well, you know, I know some of the groups. Of course. Okay. We never heard anybody else. It was kind of hard to do that. I would like to say thank you to Kevin and the leadership team of NPM. You know what, another little trick is you can lay these down and then we can see each other a little bit better. But thanks for inviting us. As you said, Kevin, we, we love handbells and we're happy to share any info. You're good? Okay. Um, and especially thanks to Daniel for hosting us. And Daniel and Kevin were part of the official schleppers who brought bells and tables and pads. Wow. So thank you, that's a big, big deal. Um, before we really get into things, I wanted to ask how many people are currently directing a handbell choir? Just, just from our information. Okay, good. How many people ring in a handbell choir? Okie dokie. <laughs> um, do, does anybody have a children's choir, a vocal choir, that then sometimes will ring bells or chimes? Okay. Okay. And do you, does anybody have a children's handbell choir? Okay. Well, it just helps us to know, you know how we're going to approach things. Um, I wanted to tell you a couple things just first about the history of handbells in the United States, handbell choirs. And then Jim's going to take it away. He's going to talk about everything <coughs> you can do with the handbell. <laughs> and then after that, um, you and I together are going to work through this whole packet of information. <coughs> There's some really practical stuff you can take home and use like right away. Um, so we'll get through as much of that as we can. And then I didn't even send out the children's choir stuff yet, and we will do that. Um, maybe privately or whatever a time allows. Okay. So um, generally, <coughs> the handbells that we have in front of us um, came, their, the derivative was in England. There were, as you're aware, of those beautiful Anglican churches with all the bell towers. Um, and centuries ago, there was something called change ringing. And change ringing was really, uh, a math, it was based on mathematical formulas which ordered the bells. And there were actually people in what was called a, a, a ringing room that would actually pull the ropes and allow those bells that weigh many tons to ring. But they had to practice this because they had to go in a certain order in order to complete the peal. So um, you know, I'm talking like the 10th century. Um, there were actually more than 5,000 bell towers in England at that time. So. Um, the, most of the towers had three to 16 bells, but the most common number was six, seven, or eight bells. So the problem arose when these bell ringers, like all of us, you know, we all like to practice. We have to practice to learn what we're doing. So bell ringers would practice actually in the towers, you know, practicing with the ropes and getting it all figured out until the townspeople just had had enough of it. They just didn't want to hear it anymore. So some very clever Englishman 
came up with the idea of creating bells that were small that you could hold in your hand. And that allowed people to practice, and, and they, I guess, had the same number of bells, I'm assuming, as what was in their tower, and they could practice the peals. And you might say, where did they do this practicing? Well, we're talking about jolly old England, so they did it in a pub. So they got together, I'm sure had a few, and then rang their bells. <laughs> so that was how handbells really were developed. It was, it was not really so much surrounding church music, but just the, the music that was played from the towers in the churches in England. You might be surprised to know, though, the first person who brought handbells to America was, does anybody know? Oh, put your hand down. <laughs> P.G. Barnum, for his big talk. He had heard handbells in England when his circus was there, and he brought them back with him. So the first bells ever rung were rung in the circus. It's sort of the same way, you know? We're still all part of the service. Um, the other notable figure who brought this whole art to the United States was a woman named Margaret Shercliffe. Um, in 1902, she was the first American woman to complete a peel in one of the towers in England. And her reward, her, her prize, was a set of eight um, Whitechapel English handbells. So she brought her set of handbells home with her to New England and um, you know, gathered friends and probably sent back for more <coughs> sets. And she created uh, the New England Guild of English Handbell Riggers. So it's something similar to our NPM. Um, so this grew throughout New England. And, and I think if I remember from my reading, she actually hosted what was the first ever <coughs> handbell festival. Uh, you know, invited people to come, and she had set out 20 chairs, and 200 people came, so it was a wild success. Um, then, through the years, the uh, handbell choirs and churches were scattered across the United States, so that in around 1950, they changed the name of the group to the American Guild of, handbell, of English Handbell Ringers. And then, to update it further, in fact, Jim was on the committee at the time, um, in 2010, it's, the name is now Handbell Musicians of America. So again, it's the same kind of support and educational group as we are familiar with with NPM. But, um, and again, a huge part, like in NPM, is educational resources and, um, and not only in print, but in it personally. You know, there, there are people who will come out and help you and do workshops and stuff like that. So we, we find the guild to be extremely helpful. Um, the other unique thing about handbells, and many of us are organists, um, I can't imagine any of us wanting to sit on an organ bench with 10 other people. But that's pretty much what we do here. It's 10, 11, 12 people who play one instrument. And you know, you will find that the melody goes through many hands. Mm -hmm. and, and again, that's so unique as compared to many other instruments. And so you have to think of yourself as really part of a team. I mean, it, it is the ultimate team sport. But, you know, you're handing that melody note to the next person, and it has to be played in the same style, um, at the same uh, dynamic level, the same intensity. You know, you're, you're really depending upon one another to create the music uh, that this one instrument plays. So I, I just find that interesting and challenging. Um, the other thing about handbells is that People hear what they see. So you want your movements to be graceful and beautiful. Now in one of my two churches, we play in the back of the church. Nobody sees us, but I always tell them we're still gonna make those beautiful moves because you know we're just learning it the right way. Um, that the other church, we're right up front on the altar, right next to, right next to the altar. So when we move from church to church, it, it helps to have that. Um, and what I mean by that is, if you are standing right where Neil is, and you look up the eye, up the row, you want to see everybody's arm moving in the same way, and um, and it just it just adds to the beauty of the sound if we're all moving in the same way. It's a very graceful thing. Um, personally, our introduction, Jim and my introduction to handbells, came from um, a couple of students who, it, when Jim was teaching in the Churchill schools, was band director and orchestra director for a few years there. And a couple of his kids um, obviously had very musical parents. 
Well, then we learned that they were the music directors at Beulah Presbyterian Church in Churchill. And so, oh, after one thing, one thing led to another, they invited us over for dinner. So there we were with Dan and Jan Hermony and Mary, four or five children, I can't remember. four, four. Um, had a great old time. You know, they were both piano teachers. There were these two baby grands in their living room. And they would have their students come for a private lesson and then come a second time for an ensemble lesson. So the, they taught, they were just <coughs> wonderful, musical people. So anyway, we did all that. We enjoyed our meal. And as we often do, you know, there's, I'm sure all of you do this, there's, there's some fun after dinner. So we went downstairs to their music room where there was a whole set of handbells. And, and I think it was the youngest little one who said, Daddy, can I play the big C? And it was the big C. <laughs> if you want to give that one a ring. Oh, I'm sorry, C. Yeah, exactly. So we always think of big C. But that was our first time to get our hands on bells. And uh, we went to several of their concerts, and they really have been our mentors and really inspirational to us. And in fact, we kind of feel like we're following in their footsteps. Um, Dan was the area chair of area two of the guild. Well, Jim is a past area chair also. So we, we just feel like we kind of have been keeping up with them and, and hope, hope we're doing them proud. So they were very sweet. Um, but anyway, since we all just ate, and now it's time for us to make some music together, what I'm going to do is turn this over to Jim because um, there's a whole sheet of handbell techniques that he will walk you through and let you know how to do all these kind of things that you never knew you could do with the handbell. So I, if you want to look through, oh, and your packet starts with a little half sheet and then there's a bunch of cool sheets. If you turn to the back, there's two gold sheets. One of them says, uh, one of them looks like it's handbell notation and Handbell notation symbols. That's what we're looking for. So Jim will tell you all about this. Yes. <laughs> After we learn to properly ring the handbell. Oh, true. Because it is, it's an acquired, it's a learned skill. Um, and just as with anything else, it's easier for some people. To learn some people learn quicker than others but it's not out of the realm of possibility for anybody just like if you are a, a choral director you would want to teach your people how to sing properly get the proper support pronunciation of all the consonants and vowels uh, with a handbell you know you you don't I'm going to take these two that you don't be using for a while you don't want some people ringing like this <laughs> Or, or like that. It's just like Mary Rita said, you want to have them all use the same style. Um, otherwise, it would be like having your choir sing words at slightly different times, starting and ending their words at different times. How bad would that be? And unfortunately, sometimes handbells can get the reputation of not playing very well, and, or not playing musically. And I think that's the, the biggest reason for that is because they never learned to ring properly in the first place. It's just like a choir, a vocal choir that wouldn't ring, that wouldn't sing well, it's probably no, because nobody ever taught them. So, if we can all get up on our feet. Um, I would ask you to each take in your favorite hand, it doesn't matter if you're right handed, of course, if you're right handed, if you're more comfortable with your left, then use your left. But take a, um, a natural bell, not any, um, and I can't quite do this with everybody, but Terry, right? Glad to meet you. That's a full bell right there. I'm going to put this bell in your hand. That's right. Now, did you notice? Oh, that's beautiful, Terry. Great job. His thumb is pointing forward. You want the person's thumb point, pointing forward, not up here. Yes. Uh, and we grip the whole way around the handle. The handle is only 
a loop so that it will have some flexibility. It's not to hold like this. Okay, so you want your, your thumb pointing forward, and the bell just rests on the collar. This round thing here is referred to as the collar. Rests on that. Now, um, if you start with the bell up here near your shoulder, and I want you to pretend that there is a fine wine in there, and you don't want to spill it. Just take the bell down toward, towards your waist, but maybe not all, and then straight out, and then back up again towards your shoulder. Okay, so you're gonna, you're gonna make a square with it. You can spill your wine. I see some wine spilling already. It's terrible. Yes, yeah, you wanna keep it the uh, bell erect. You wanna get your hand wrap up, yeah. We don't need a death grip on it, but you, you want, your, want your fingers around there and it helps to support it. How are we looking in the second row here? Beautiful. Looking good? Okay. Now, as you come out here, <laughs> and you want to try to keep your elbows in towards your body, not this way. That would hurt after a while. Just make that... Uh, all right. Now, next time you get the bell far away from your body, just give it a little flick, and then bring it right back up. stop when you get out there, just keep moving the whole time. There is a little uh, symbol on the handle, yeah. and you want to make, I think we had them all on the table the right way. You want that symbol to be facing you when you play? That's just uh, standard. The reason for that is the bell should be set so that the clapper is closer on the side that does not have the symbol. Okay, and it should be further, the clapper should be further away on the cymbal side. And if you look inside the bell, right where the clapper is hitting, there's a little line, there's a little score in there. Well, some little elf at the handbell factory sits around all day and listens to the bell struck in different places. And wherever he determines that the best, if you get the best sound, that's where he puts that score. So the clapper should be lined up with the uh, with that line in there, and that's where you want it. That's where you want it to ring. Okay. So now everybody just did that procedure with your favorite hand. Now I'm going to ask you to switch to your other favorite to your other favorite hand. Yes, that doesn't get quite as much use, and do the same thing again. The procedure is exactly the same. So go around a couple of times.
having fun yet? Yes. 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 <laughs> Good. Now, a couple of things. Um, it's very easy for people in the beginning to extend the bell too far and not like this. The larger the bell, the harder that is on your wrist. So we don't do that. Once upon a time, the favored procedure for ringing was actually to go like this. But then it was realized people kept getting in carpal tunnel problems. Um, so we, you know, the uh, proper ringing technique was like this, which actually musically makes a lot more sense. And I'll show you why. I want you to take a bell in either hand, ring it, and go like this. A speaker, the sound does not go this way. The sound comes out from the shoulder right here, this way. Where do you want the sound to go? Do you want it to go to the ceiling? Or do you want it to go to the congregation or your audience? You want it to go to the audience. So you hold it like this, it goes that way. If you hold it like this, it's going to the ceiling and the floor. And then the ceiling and the floor will never appreciate the sound of the bell. <laughs> Okay, um, now that's a you know pretty quick um, lesson in how to ring, but I think you all got the, the idea. It was looking pretty good. The, the danger that you want to watch for when you teach people how to do this is they like to start to go like this. But somehow that, that does feel more natural, but it's um, whether you want to picture a bicycle wheel coming towards you you back up the bicycle or uh, pitching a softball so like big that going underhanded or rolling a bowling ball you go underhand this way so for directors that's what you want to watch out for but I answer your question about yeah because I think I learned the other way more wow. like this yeah definitely and I seem to remember something too about this was the grip and you bounced it off your um, Sort of, yeah. But I think the idea is that just to keep these uh, three fingers loose, you really hold it between your thumb and your forefinger. Okay. But um, if it helps you to, to think of bouncing a handle off your, off your hand, about the heel of your hand, then fine. Yeah. Yeah, that works well. Just don't get out too far. Okay. Okay, um, now you all have, oh, oh, the name Donald Allured, um, some of us, you know, uh, are familiar with that name. He was, uh, and still is, God bless him, the kind of the guru of handbell ringing in America. He literally wrote the book, and there's a copy, an autographed copy on that table over there that you can, you can see later. Mary Rita, hold it up. Um, he passed, uh, I think, four years ago now um, to Handbell Heaven. But, uh, and, the, and the book, it will tell you just about everything you ever need to know, and it is still in publication. So I would strongly recommend that you get that, and study it, and use it, because just about everything you need to know about starting and maintaining a handbell choir will be in there. If the style is a little old-fashioned, because that's just kind of the, the guy he was, and it reads a bit like a master's thesis, but um, anyway, that's a it's a, a good resource. And why did I start down this road? Uh, There's no dummies version, is there? Uh, well, dummies understand that pretty well. Okay. I got I got that pretty well. Um, I forget. Oh, that's why. <laughs> Donald Elliot said that there are really three ways to uh, to ring a bell. Uh, two of which are wrong. <laughs> I'm going to take these two that are better. Just like anything in music, you know, the, the note, notes have a time value, right? And what ringers will tend to do is usually overextend that time value because they forget to do yes. this. Mm -hmm. 
we refer to that as damping. So Donald Elliott's point was, you can ring a bell like this. Or you can do it like this. If you have consecutive notes. One is, you know, it just, uh, just doesn't sound good. <laughs> and neither does the other. But you need to learn to do this. To ring and damp at the same time. So that the so that you will have a legato kind of sound. Now granted, there will be pieces of music where you don't want that, but that's few and far between. And can you imagine? Well. Doesn't sound good. <laughs> doesn't sound good. So let's just take a little practice in that. You're gonna have to do both bells, and you want to damp. There's a spot, you know, right below your uh, your shoulder blades, where it's, you know, you got a little uh, fat spot there, and that's the best place to touch. Sometimes with the bigger bells, you need to get down a little lower. Um, let's see if this one will do. It might not be quite good. If you listen real close, you you don't knock off all the overtones right away. So the larger bells, yeah, you need to get more on your body. Throughout this day, there's there's several little hand bells, phrases that we say. So this is the time for you. Particularly, yeah. you need to beware of the bling. So we're not uh, up against some brooch or... Uh, or sequins. Yeah, sequins. Yeah. So we need to keep moving here. So just try that. to the bells, we also have hand chimes. Both the manufacturers make hand chimes, and it really looks like a big tuning fork. Um, sometimes they're the favorite uh, to use with children because they are not quite as fragile. Uh, they're a little lighter. Uh, and, the only, and you ring them exactly the same way.
experts at ringing and damping chiming bells. Uh, I'd like to call your attention to this gold sheet that Mary Rita mentioned. I will not go through everything because it, the sheet goes way beyond the, the basics of what we need to do uh, or what you might see in the music. Um, but I'll just go over some of the, the most popular ones that, that you'll see. Um, I can move this aside a little bit and clear a spot here for us. So, Thank you. Uh, I think if you want to go down the, the list a little bit, the, the uh, third one down the damp sign, it kind of looks like a target sign. Um, that's kind of, it's fallen a bit out of favor. You don't see it too often in, in newly published music. But you will see it occasionally right on the stem of a note. Because sometimes the music, if you are not supposed to damp in the handbell music, it'll say that. Um, I don't know what music we might have in front of us that would have that. It's an LV sign means let it vibrate. So you don't damp until you see the next LV sign or an R or one of these little circles with the, with the damp on it. Um, and of course, you can damp either, as I showed you, on your shoulder, or you can damp on the table. The one that's preferable is usually up to you.